Hi, I'm Steve Melvin, Extension Educator with the University of Nebraska Extension. And today we're going to continue talking about how to schedule irrigation with soil water data. This is Chapter 4, Advanced Irrigation Scheduling Techniques. If you've missed any of the previous ones, I encourage you to go back and watch those. The first advanced irrigation scheduling technique we're going to calculate involves inches of available water. And to do this, we'll take a look at the center column in the chart that is titled Soil Water Above or Below Field Capacity in Inches Per Foot of Soil. If you take a look, if you had a watermark reading of 15, you can see that you would have a positive 0.5. And what that number means is that you would be one half inch above field capacity in this one foot layer of soil. If you were below field capacity and had a reading of 70, then you can see you would have a negative 0.64 inches. And what that means is that you would have to add back 0.64 inches of water to that one foot layer of soil to bring it back up to field capacity. So using this chart has some advantages. They include provides the most accuracy, simple to determine using the charts, determines how much water is left, how much it will hold, and how quickly irrigation is needed to be started, provides a must-have number to determine how much water is needed at the end of the irrigation season. A disadvantage includes it does require some calculations and a little bit more time. So let's take a look through an example of how we would use this column in the chart. We've put together a scenario, the same one we've been using with the other videos as well, where we've got corn at the silking stage, and the top foot reading is 15 centibars, the second is 100, the third is 70. So let's put those on the chart. See the 15 is the top one. We take a look in the chart that shows 0.5. So if we move that over into our box where we're doing the calculations, you can see that 125% of plant available water, and we calculated that in the last video, it would also be on a silt loam soil, one half inch of water above field capacity. We draw in the 100 reading, it would be 0.87 below field capacity, or in other words, a negative number. We put that on our chart. And then the third one would be 70, or a negative 0.64 on our chart. When we add these numbers together, you can see that we end up with a negative 1.01 inches of water. And what that means is that if we wanted to refill the profile back to field capacity, we would have to put in 1.1 inches. So if we were planning to set the center pivot to put on one inch of water, we would also know that it would just fill the profile. And if this number was 0.5 and we were putting on an inch, we would know that we would be over irrigating. So it's an important number to know in how much water the soil will hold. There's a little bit of a shortcut method that we can get to this answer quicker. So let's take a look through that. Knowing that we're trying to calculate how much water the soil can hold before we would be above field capacity, we know that we can draw a box around showing that we've got zeros at field capacity. If we draw a line around the 83% of plant available water, remember that's the number we calculated previously in the previous video, and that would be an average number. In other words, each of those three feet on average could hold 0.33 inches and would just bring them up to field capacity. If we multiply that times three feet of soil, and you can see that it would hold one inch of water would be required to come back to field capacity. Or this says 0.99, but it's just a rounding error versus the other method that we use to calculate how much water the soil would hold. The next number that we would like to calculate would be how long until we need to refill the profile with irrigation water. In other words, how many days until the crop will need water. Well, first off, we need to know how much water is left in the soil. So to do that, we start out at our 83%, our negative 0.33. We put that in the box on the right, and we also come down to 50% of plant available water. Remember, that's the level we do not want to go below, and that's a negative 0.98. When we subtract two negative numbers, we end up with a positive one, and you can see that on average, each of those three feet of soil would have 65 hundredths of an inch of water. Multiply that times three, and we can see that in that three foot profile, we can still use 1.95 inches of water before the crop would be stressed. So this gives us a good indication of how much water we can use before we need to get irrigation completed in the field. This chart is for Nebraska, and it talks about the amount of water we can expect a crop to use on average during certain growth stages. And of course, being in Nebraska, it implies a certain time of the year that we would be growing these crops. 
If you were in a different state, you would need to know these numbers based upon your planting dates and the average weather conditions. But for corn and silking stage at Nebraska, we would expect it to use maybe 0.3 inches of water per day. If the forecast was for really warm, windy, dry conditions, you might raise that number up a little bit. If it's supposed to be cool, cloudy, we might lower it just a little bit. But on average, it's about 0.3. Now we have the information to calculate how many days before we need to get irrigation completed in the field. We can see in our box we've got 1.95 inches of water left in the top three feet and we plan to use 0.3 inches per day. So we could have six and a half days before we need to have the field completely irrigated before we would expect to lose any yield because of moisture stress. So back to our scenario where we're expecting a good chance of some heavy rains in two days and we know that it takes three and a half days to have the pivot go around. If we wait and see if it's going to rain and it doesn't, we still have four and a half days to complete the irrigation cycle. So now we're pretty confident that we could wait and see if it's going to rain in a couple days before we start the pivots. The second advanced irrigation scheduling is to create and maintain a drier zone in the 12 to 24 inch depth. So advantages of this is stops deep percolation. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. The idea is to create a drier zone to provide space to store water. That would mostly be from rainfall we would plan for. Create a drier zone to watch for irrigation scheduling purposes. Then the idea is that if the drier zone starts to get wetter, we can delay the next irrigation a day or two. However, if the drier zone continues to get drier, we know we're not keeping up with the water use of the crop and we need to keep the system running. Disadvantages of this, it's less accurate than calculating water levels and you need some experience to make good decisions using this technique. If we're going to use this technique, we need to understand a little bit about how drought stress at different growth stages of corn impact the final corn yield. And this chart helps us understand that evapotranspiration deficit impact on corn yields. Yeah, that's quite a mouthful, but it's fairly easy to understand if we just take a look at what's on the chart. Across the top is an evapotranspiration deficit. The zero on the right hand side refers to a fully watered field where the corn has all the water it would like. The 0.5 would mean that it only had half as much water as it needed to produce a full yield. On the right side is the same kind of a chart referring to the final grain yield. The zero would mean that it had a full yield, and the 0.5 would mean that it only had half as much yield. So how does that lay out when we take a look during the vegetative stage? We've got a fairly flat line on that. And the vegetative stage is just not that sensitive to uh, moisture stress. You can see if we had a 0.2 deficit, we would only end up with about an 8% yield loss. And remember, the vegetative stage is a, is a really long growing period. And in Nebraska, you're just never going to have drought stress on it the entire time. And the research that's been done in Nebraska would suggest that some drought stress late in the vegetative stage, which is when we would usually expect to have it, just simply doesn't impact the yield, if any, at all. In fact, I've seen some times when it ends up a little bit higher yield. However, during the flowering stage, it's a much different story. If we take a look during tassel time, if we had a 20% deficit with the evapotranspiration, we would expect to have about a 30% decrease in yield. So it's very sensitive to drought stress during the pollination. And the early grain fill period is very sensitive as well. However, the vegetative and the ripening stage, a little bit of drought stress typically never changes the final yield. This second chart shows another important concept to understand for this technique. What it describes is a hydraulic conductivity of a silt loam soil. In other words, that's just a fancy way of saying how fast does water move down through the soil profile. And this is laid out in inches of water per 60 days. And there's nothing magic about 60 days. It's just a number that I picked that is about the average length of time that we irrigate corn in most of Nebraska. And if we look on the left-hand side, there's inches of water per 60 days. And the first vertical line is field capacity. And we can see that if there's about five inches of water would deep percolate if we kept a silt loam soil at field capacity for all of those 60 days. That's what I mentioned earlier. If we keep it at field capacity, the plant's pretty happy, but we're deep percolating quite a bit of water. However, if we can just get that one layer of soil down to 70% of plant available water, it reduces that amount of deep percolation down to under one inch, which is certainly a, a much better goal to shoot for. So keeping that chart in mind, let's look at some layers of soil. Each of these blocks represent a one foot layer of soil. The top foot is of course where all the water lands from sprinkler irrigation and from rainfall. 
And so the top foot has to fill up and get above field capacity before we get much water moving into the second foot. And then the second foot has to get quite a bit of water in it before it will move down to the third foot and so on. And so this might be an example of a time in the early spring when we've gotten some good moisture in the top couple of feet are getting pretty well full of moisture, but then as it moves on down, it hasn't quite refilled yet. This graph would represent a little bit later in the spring after we've completely refilled the top four feet of the profile. In an irrigated field, it really doesn't take that much water to do that, and then we can have quite a bit of water move down through the profile. This could also represent a time in the summer if we're over irrigating. Center pivots can put on more water than the crop can use in most situations, and that water will simply move down through the profile. It won't stay on the top and, and make a lake or anything. It just moves down through the profile on a well-drained soil. This graph shows this technique in action. We've used earlier in the season water from the top two feet by not irrigating to create this drier zone at the second foot. Now, because of rainfall or because of irrigation, we've got the top foot fairly wet and that second foot fairly dry. That way, the deep percolation is essentially shut off and we have a place to keep an eye on. If that area gets, starts getting wetter, we know we can delay irrigation a little bit. And if it starts to continue to get dry on down into the third foot, we know we need to keep the system running. It makes a very good way to monitor how good our irrigation scheduling is going, as well as it pretty well eliminates deep percolation. One of the criticisms of this technique, and in general, the university's recommendation to allow the crop to use the remaining soil water down to 40% by the time the crop matures, is that, well, we're going to have to pump the water sometime and we just as well keep the field wet going into the fall. But the fact of the matter is, if you've got a four foot profile at 40% plant available water on a sandy soil, it only takes about 2.4 inches to refill the profile. And if it's a loam or a silt loam, it's five inches or less. And in all of Nebraska, almost every year, you will receive more than five inches of off season precipitation. And in most parts of the state in most years, much more than that. And so it makes perfect sense to allow the crop to use this water up and then we can allow the wintertime off-season precipitation to refill the profile. So let's quickly review this chart again and observe that at field capacity during a 60-day irrigation season we would deep percolate about five inches of water. And you can see the line goes up very quickly if we keep the field wetter than field capacity, which unfortunately some producers do. So we definitely want to keep our soil water content, at least in some layer of the soil, less than field capacity. And if we were able to keep it down at 70%, you can see that we almost eliminate deep percolation because it would be less than one inch. Let's take a look at this chart of a field where this technique was used. And you can see that the white triangles representing the second foot sensor got down to about 80 before the first irrigation was applied. Then notice that the readings of that sensor, as well as the top foot, got very wet very quickly. And this is a good telltale sign that some water slipped down along the sensor. The second fact is that their numbers then dried out very quickly over just a day or so back down into that 40-50 range. So if you see this with watermark sensors, or as far as that goes, anybody else's sensors, you know that the water cannot move through the soil that quickly and that some water had to slip down along the side of the sensor. It's not really a big issue. You can certainly go out and repack the soil around the sensor to correct the problem, or you can just ignore it because it'll be drained away in a day or two and the readings will be back to normal. Also notice that the black circles that represent the third foot sensor started to dry down and move into this range. This is exactly what we want to see because we want to use some of that deeper water a little bit earlier in the season so we can have it used up by the time the crop matures. So now that we've talked about this technique, I'm sure you're wondering how do we create it in the field. Well, let's go back and review this chart where this technique was used. As you can see, early in the season, the readings from the top sensor represented by the white circles shows the water is being used from the top foot to begin with. Now at this point, most of the crop roots were probably there. Then a rain was received. You can see that once again, the water out of the top foot was used first. And that's just simply the way it works with plants. They use the water that's easiest to get. And if the top foot has plenty of moisture, that is a place where it's going to find that water. Then you can see that the white triangles representing the second foot start to dip down pretty considerably. So that's simply the way that it works. You've got to take the water out of the top foot during that vegetative stage 
Now, these sensor readings show that we stayed in the green and no water stress was experienced by the crop, but even if it had dipped down a little bit, as we showed earlier, you wouldn't expect any yield loss from it. Then a little bit later on in the season, you can see as the roots get on deeper and the water in the top part of the profile is used, the water in that third foot starts to go away as well. So you need to start out kind of early during the vegetative stage to create this setup so you have the drier zone in the 12 to 24 inch zone. The chart that we have been using represents a silt loam soil that holds 2 inches of water per foot. But keep in mind that there are 11 of these charts in the series and you need to make sure you get the correct one for the soil type in your field. As you can see, we go to a fine sandy loam, the color bars across change considerably, and if we go to a loamy fine sand, they're different yet again. And so, just to emphasize the point, it's very important for you to obtain the right chart for your field. So if you'd like to use these charts, you can search on the UNL Extension Publications for EC3036, Irrigation Scheduling Strategies When Using Soil Water Data. All of these charts are in there, in addition to the instructions on how to use them. This completes Chapter 4, Advanced Irrigation Scheduling. Please join me for Chapter 5 when we'll talk about end-of-season irrigation scheduling.